uh, tibia technique uh, is what I'm going to discuss with you this morning. Um, so when just some principles, uh, if you're going to lengthen the leg, you have to cut the tibia and the fibula. You have to fix the tibia and the fibula at the proximal and distal ends. So uh, we call this, instead of syndesmosis screws, we call it fibula length stabilization screws, because it's really different. It's not exactly like a syndesmosis screw. And then you should understand the usual tendencies for what kind of deformity happens with what kind of lengthening. And I, as has been discussed, valgus and procurvatum are the things that typically happen in the tibia when left to its own um, uh, natural tendencies. And so you can use blocking screws to prevent this by placing them in the concavity of the deformity, which would be lateral and posterior. Um, this is particularly needed if the, if the um, nail diameter is less than the intramedullary diameter at the uh, osteotomy site. And then, of course, remember, always make your nail long enough so that you don't uh, end up with too little thick part in the, in the moving fragment. And for me, I always like to shoot for about five centimeters. And then I usually choose the osteotomy based on the apex of the deformity or the quality of the bone. So here's a woman with a 25-year-old congenital LLD, 35 millimeters of discrepancy, and a valgus deformity. Um, these are her preoperative x-rays. You can see that there's an apex of deformity. And so we're going to cut the bone at that apex. That's how I plan my osteotomy level. I plan my nail length based on the, the things we talked about, the osteotomy level plus the lengthening, plus 50, plus 30. And, uh, and that's how I end up planning my nail. That, that number comes out to 265, so I'm going to use either a 275 or a 305. I think in this business, there are long nailers and short nailers. And uh, you know I, everybody has their own sort of style. It's like an artist. You can tell somebody's x-rays. Uh, I think some of the adult surgeons tend to be longer nailers because you know, it's a very trauma type of uh, thing to try to put in a long nail. And so some of the, and the peds guys tend, maybe tend to be shorter nails, but you know, who knows, who knows? Um, these are some uh, intraoperative pictures. You can see the rotational markers. I use Steinman pins placed out of the path of the nail. Uh, proximally, it's posterior, and, uh, and distally, it's just beyond the nail. And um, in a case like this, the, the, I decided that a blocking screw was not necessary. Why? Because you can see the nail is basically sitting on the lateral cortex at the end of the case. And it can't go into valgus, right? I mean, essentially, there's no room for a, if there's no room for a blocking screw, it means you don't need a blocking screw. It's a good way to think about it if you're putting in the blocking screw at the end of the case. Because the nail's plastered to the lateral cortex, it can't, this will not go into more valgus as you're doing the lengthening. The same thing. If you look at this, it's plastered along the posterior cortex. And so there's no need for a blocking screw in this kind of case. You got your tibia fibula screws, uh, proximal and distal. I would um, recommend putting them in on an angle. It's a little, you get a little more stability. And then the other issue is I, I would recommend not using cannulated screws. I, I usually will use a cannulated technique, but I'll put in solid screws because the cannulated screws um, will break. I found them breaking. And this, as you can see, the lengthening. This is at the end of the distraction, during consolidation, and then the healing at the end. This is the final uh, x-ray. You can see there's a little deficiency anteriorly. Um, and as I was saying, more than five centimeters of the thick nail is present in the distal segment. That's what that whole SNL, short nail length type of analysis, is about. There's the end. Okay, um, it is interesting though. I mean, if you if you're critical, you could see it's still in a little valgus. So, you know, even though you look at the X-ray on the right and it looks like it's pretty straight, you could see I didn't entirely correct the valgus. If I wanted to really correct the valgus a little more aggressively, a blocking screw maybe would have helped, and uh, and that's illustrated in this case. You can see here there's 25 millimeters of LLD. There's a there's a deformity. Um, the osteotomy apex is at that level. Um, 
I'm, I anticipate that the, you can see the path of my nail is such that there's going to be room laterally. And so in a situation like that, I think putting the blocking screw in is very helpful. And it gives you a more aggressive correction of the deformity. You can see the, what, what the blocking screw does. You know, it really pushes it over. And in this case, we would not have been able to correct that valgus to the same degree without the blocking screw. So the lengthening then progresses, as you can see here. And you can see in the end, and here really we got a very, very effective correction of the valgus deformity with that lateral blocking screw. Um, you know, people, there's, so there are a couple of things about tibias versus femurs. They don't heal as quickly. And uh, I show this case really to show this was a, a, a gentleman who's 68 years old and we lengthened his tibia. It was his lifelong dream to finally get rid of this leg length discrepancy. And, um, and so I was a bit hesitant because of his age and because it's a tibia, but we went ahead and did it. Uh, this is what it looks like at the end. You can see the blocking screw in place to prevent the flexion deformity, um, which I think was a good idea. You can see the lengthening progressing. Now with him, I actually, I was concerned about healing. So I, and you can see the blocking screw laterally as well. So you can see the blocking screw has really helped prevent any deformity. I made my osteotomy a little bit more proximal uh, to have better bone quality. You can see that the alignment is correct. Now, I, I'm a big believer in this BMAC, bone marrow aspirate concentrate injections. And so sometimes I do it, you know, if I'm back in the operating room for any reason, I do it. Like if, for example, if I'm doing something else, changing a screw, doing a soft tissue release, I always do it. In, in this case, I actually planned it in advance as a stage thing at the end because I believe in it so strongly. Um, but you can see his healing was fantastic. 68-year-old guy, and he healed like a 25-year-old. Um, you know, we've used, this is an example of a girl who had uh, congenital, she had Russell Silver Syndrome, and then we, uh, we planned uh, um, a two-stage lengthening over the course of her childhood. The first stage of the lengthening was at age eight, where we used a fixator, and then we waited until skeletal maturity. So the point of this is to reinforce the point, if you're gonna do a tibia uh, lengthening, make sure that you are skeletally mature, or at least on the verge of skeletal maturity. And so um, I won't do this before the age of 14 uh, in a girl or 16 in a boy, but make sure that there is enough skeletal maturity. Um, and you can see it's the same, um, the same principles. You can see the healing is very, very nice. But if you look carefully at the next um, uh, picture, you can see this is my broken cannulated uh, screw. Again, not a big deal, but I kind of learned that better just you're going to get more strength uh, out of a non-cannulated screw. I do believe that it's helpful to put the screw in proximally and distally. This way you really maintain your fibula length. You know, if the fibula pulls down from the proximal end, it's not the worst thing in the world, but it's not great because you'll tighten up your biceps femoris, you'll tighten up your lateral collateral ligament, and you can get a flexion contracture. So it's really better not to, uh, not to deal with that. It takes, it takes a minute at the end of the surgery. Um, you can use the tibia lengthening sometimes when the femur lengthening is not an option. So here's an example of a, of a very complex um, hip patient that was referred to me by one of my revision uh, hip replacement colleagues, you can see she's got, she's, this looks like she had a um, uh, hip replacement after an old um, uh, Ilizarov hip reconstruction and very complicated. You could tell that it's a, it's a constrained hip. And so the idea here was she had a seven centimeter leg length discrepancy. There's no way we want to deal with the hip, especially with the, with the instability issues. This also was at a time before we had a short enough retrograde nail. Uh, but the hip instability is an issue, so we went ahead and did the lengthening in the tibia, and, and that worked out very nicely. So sometimes you can go to the opposite bone, even though you're going to end up with a knee height difference, depending on, you have, to, you, know, you have to use your judgment about what is the situation. In this situation, it was because of hip instability, so stay away from the femur. That's before and after. Um, just some principles of fixator assisted uh, nailing for deformity correction, right? You can, you can correct your deformity at the same time 
as you're nailing. So you can see here there's a valgus deformity. And the, uh, the, the idea here is that you're going to, to correct this deformity, you have to put your nail in a particular trajectory in the proximal segment, right? So this is the apex of the deformity. The only way you're going to be able to hold your nail in this position is by putting a blocking screw in the lateral side and using fix it or assisted technique. So I will uh, plan it accordingly. You can see, so I, in this case, I do the drill holes first. I put my blocking screws in um, second to help with the, with the path of the nailing, right? And so you can see that's the trajectory of the nail in my proximal segment. And then you can see I use the fixator to correct the deformity, straighten it out, pass the guide wire, and then continue, continue the nailing. So these, the fixator pins, just like I was showing before, out of the path of the nail, proximally they're posterior, and distally it is, uh, uh, distally it is um, uh, beyond the nail. So the steps in the operation for me are blocking screws, X-fix pins, osteotomy, then correct the deformity, hold it with the external fixator, pass the guide wire, ream in the corrected position, and then insert the rod. This happens to be a super, uh, super patellar approach. It has the advantages of that you can do it in the semi-extended position, and so there are some advantages with that. And then it looks very busy because there's a bunch of blocking screws, but that's the, uh, that's the situation. You got your blocking screws above and below. Um, I've used tibia nailing above ankle fusions. I showed this case the other day um, where we did a excision of this uh, talus implant and there was a five centimeter uh, bone deficiency. And so while we used, we did a tibiocalcaneal fusion and with a fixator, we did the lengthening proximally with a nail. And, and it is easier, it is an easier technique to do it this way than to, to add another ring. So we got, the t we got a bifocal treatment, if you will, uh, using external fixation and internal fixation. This is the progression of the healing. You can see the healing worked out very nicely at the top and at the bottom simultaneously. And even with a tibiocalcaneal uh, fusion, if you have the optimal position and you have the optimal leg it's length, you actually can have a patient who, who walks quite nicely and is, is happy with the result. And um, just a final case to show you, sometimes you'll combine tibia with femur, right? So here you have a five centimeter leg length discrepancy related to a fibular hemimelia. Uh, the, the source of the deformity is both above the knee and below the knee, and so uh, you can approach this with a bifocal approach, meaning a femur lengthening for just the lengthening part, and then on the tibia, you can do correction of the deformity at the same time. Again, you're fixing the valgus, so the blocking screw was felt to be important here. You can see um, it positioned in the correct position. You can see the, the, um, the fibula length stabilization screws up at the top and up the bottom, and then by doing that, we're able to get the lengthening that we needed, and the correction of the deformity. The healing went on to be very, very nice and, uh, and effective. So the post-op regimen for me, for tibia, usually is I start on post-op day seven. Uh, it's later than I do for the tibia. Um, I usually do 0 0.25 uh, millimeters four times a day for the first four days, and then I slow it to three times a day, so I'm usually going 0.75 millimeters per day. I monitor the x-rays every 14 days and then adjust the rate accordingly. Um, the rehabilitation is, the weight bearing is based on the diameter of the nail, right? 30 pounds with an 8.5 nail and, and 50 pounds with a 10.7 and uh, 70 pounds with a 12.5. It's very rare that you get the 12.5 nail in, 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 in a uh, tibia. Uh, ankle and, and knee range of motion are important. Obviously the most critical thing is ankle dorsiflexion. And so you have to make, many of these patients will require a gastrosoleus recession um, surgery, either at the time of the initial surgery or in a stage fashion. You have to kind of decide about that. In my experience, and, and also a study that we published, basically showed that if you're lengthening above four centimeters, they have a very, very high likelihood of needing a uh, gastrosoleus recession surgery. 
And uh, again, to reiterate, bone healing is definitely slower than the, f in the femur. And if you're having trouble, you can consider a, a BMAC injection surgery. Thank you.